Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to Positive Beast Stride Staying In Together program. Tonight we've got Simon Collins with us. Simon Collins is a well-known figure in the field of HIV. He founded the internationally respected HIV information website iBase over 24 years ago. He's a treatment advocate and encourages people to take an active role in their health and works supporting HIV communities everywhere. Some of you may remember that Simon joined us at the breakout of the pandemic uh, with some very valuable information. Uh, he's, um, he's a much loved friend of Positive East uh, and he's back with us again tonight. Simon Collins, it's great to have you back with us. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, thanks Craig, thanks. Great stuff. What have you been doing since you were last with us? I've been writing too much about COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> so I like writing about HIV and HIV treatment and, and this sort of knocked everyone so badly that I just thought that in order to understand this is what we're all worried about and have been worried about since March, April. And so uh, to understand for myself what's going on with COVID-19, it then makes it easier to, uh, to explain that to other people. So I was spending a lot of time tracking research and there's a huge amount of, there's a huge amount going on both in terms of treatment and vaccine research and so there's lots we can talk about. So um, for those of us, um, I know that you're a well-known figure in the H HIV scene internationally and here in London, but for those of us that haven't seen you before who are watching this, can you give us a bit of information about your background, please, Simon? Um, so I, uh, first of all, I'm HIV positive and uh, I was lucky enough to be caught by treatment in the 90s. So the mid 90s, I had no CD4 cell and, and then just without expecting treatment to work, I was very lucky and I came from zero CD4 counts. Steadily, they went up and up and up. And uh, I got interested in finding out about treatment choices and which, there were lots of drugs back then and I wanted to know which ones were the best for me and my friends and for people I knew. Uh, and then uh, that, 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 evolved really from volunteer into working at a project where I was a treatment officer or a treatment information person and then uh, ended up helping to form my base and I've been doing that since. So I'm very very lucky to have a job that at all and I'm just lucky to have a job which I really uh, enjoy doing where I can learn about the stuff I find interesting. So Tell us then, if uh, people with HIV, we, in the outbreak of a second wave, we've been expecting this, but we're getting a lot of concerned clients that are contacting us, worried if they, if they need to be, and they want to know what measures can they take. Can you tell us um, what you, you discovered uh, in your research into COVID? Well, the, the, um, the first wave that happened back in March and April uh, which uh, nobody really predicted. Uh, we sort of stumbled our way through. We didn't have very much information, certainly at the beginning, on, on the implications of HIV. Uh, we were very concerned about whether we would be at higher risk or if we caught coronavirus, whether we would have worse outcomes. Uh, and, uh, and steadily over the last six months, really, we, uh, we are more certain that HIV doesn't make a huge difference. And marginally, there might be a little bit higher risks for some people, um, but the HIV itself isn't, a, isn't a, a huge concern. All the other traditional factors, though, definitely are. So in the general population, the things that, are, uh, that increase your risk of having a, a serious reaction to coronavirus uh, are things like... Um, definitely age, the older you are, above 60 or 70, but above, certainly above 60, your risks really go up much, much greater. Men are slightly higher risk than women. If you've got other complications, if you've got other health complications, like you know, a history of heart disease, or if you've got hypertension now, or high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, if you're obese or overweight, these things are, all contribute to a higher risk of uh, of worse outcomes from coronavirus. Uh, and so it, it's just as important now as we're coming into the second wave, which was all perfectly predicted six months ago. Everybody who was following this research understood that we're going to have a second wave, even on the TV. I remember back in April that uh, 
uh, it was very common saying this is the first wave and we want to just spread out the time, protect the NHS until the second wave comes. Well, we're now definitely in the second wave uh, and uh, the cases have gone up um, two or three or maybe four times as much many cases now as there was back in April. So back in April, we were having four or 5,000 cases diagnosed every day. And now we're up at 15, 16, 17,000 cases across the UK being diagnosed every day. So the bottom line is people need to take this very seriously. We need to go back to all those safety, uh, that safety advice we were given in terms of uh, you know, the personal hygiene, in terms of hand washing, if you're out, don't touch, you know, you're touching surfaces, don't scratch your eyes or your face or pick your nose or something. Uh, that's the way the virus gets in or one of the ways the virus gets in. Uh, and the other way is, uh, is being in, con in confined spaces, really, being inside with people who might have coronavirus. So much, we're much, much less concerned now about being out and out in the open air and so it's easier to still meet friends outside whatever the regulations are the concern really isn't sitting in the park with some of your friends the concern is uh, sitting with people inside where ventilation isn't so great um, and especially if people don't know they have coronavirus so all that advice everyone all your clients everybody that's connected to positive east you've got to make sure you really look after yourselves uh, go back it's very nice that we had these few months where we could relax a little bit more, but the virus is the same now as it was back in April. We don't really have a huge amount of drugs. Uh, we want everyone to be just as careful at, uh, at minimizing the risk from now on. Masks are definitely in uh, and uh, they make a difference. They protect you and they protect the people around you. Uh, and uh, just trying to think what else has changed. There's a little bit of a different understanding. And there's a little bit less concern about catching coronavirus from, sub, from surfaces. So right at the beginning in March and April, everyone was very anxious about study that showed, you know, stainless steel was, was worse than clothes and that the virus stays active for a few days on hard surfaces. I think that, that side of the research has been... Uh, understood to not be quite as serious as we thought it was back then. Still be careful, wash your hands if you're on public transport or, or you go, go shopping, come back and wash your hands when you come back in. Uh, but, but don't be so anxious about that, maybe the way people were right at the beginning. Uh, so the update here, not many slides, and, and I don't, I, I'm not keen on too many slides anyway, but this is just sort of, sort of setting the scene in London is that a few weeks ago, if we were doing this talk, you could have been looking at the, uh, at the map of new infections and all the London boroughs were maybe reporting less than 10 infections a day. And uh, last week, if you looked up, then most of the boroughs had changed to be reporting between 100 and 200 or 200 and 400 infections a day. This changed very, very rapidly. Um, and similarly, although the, the number of across the country, although the number of uh, hospitalizations started off very low and and people who died from coronavirus started off very low within two or three weeks this has changed as well so we have to take this very seriously it's the, as I said before it's the same virus it hasn't got any worse or any better and so you're not going to expect our reactions to be any worse or better they're going to be just as serious as it was back then uh, the NHS because of the, the sheer volume of, uh, of number of people who've been treated, has got more experience at managing coronavirus. And so the outcomes are hopefully gonna be a little bit better, but it's not because there's any breakthroughs in treatment. Compared to April, we now have a drug called um, Remdesivir, uh, which is approved as a treatment of, uh, for, uh, for people who are hospitalized. Uh, if it's used early, if it's used early on. So remdesivir works against the virus and the virus, first of all, you breathe it in and it's a, an infection that's in your, uh, your throat and your, your nose. So it's all up, up in, up in your nasal passages and your throat for the first week or so. That's, that's a viral infection there. Uh, 
if coronavirus progresses, then it goes down into your lungs and it becomes more serious. So remdesivir you really want to use early on. Uh, and then the only other treatment change we've had is there's a, a steroid called dexamethasone. And there's a UK study actually showed that this made to, makes a big difference, but you have to be pretty seriously ill in order for it to make a difference. So you have to be either on oxygen or you have to be uh, in a medically induced coma in order to have oxygen, and, which is called intubation. And, and people in that situation, this is gonna make a big difference to your outcome, uh, to, to the, your risk of dying really, by it drops it by about a third. But that's all we have. We don't have um, uh, a whole lot of other new drugs that have been developed over the last six months. Uh, that makes it really important to follow hygiene, distancing. All that advice back then, we've had a nice little break where we got used to seeing our friends again. Uh, and unfortunately, we have to go back to being really careful again. And the news about a vaccine, you know, although we may get, we may, we may hear encouraging results that a, va that a vaccine is working before Christmas, I don't think any of us are going to get a chance to use it. That's if we're lucky. Otherwise, it's going to be well into next year before we know if there's a successful vaccine. Uh, this is the uh, so look. This is the uh, the daily chart. So there's this website here. It's a government website, and you can go and see the number of tests each day. And you can see this was back in April, and this is now. So these are the people who were diagnosed with coronavirus. Uh, and uh, and the reason it's higher now is we have more tests around. Uh, so with HIV, uh, luckily, uh, being HIV positive doesn't seem to have a big impact on either the risk of you catching coronavirus or the risk of having more severe outcomes uh, if you are unlucky and you, you have COVID-19. Uh, and then the other risk factors that we want to be aware about is other health complications, diabetes, lung complications. If you uh, have uh, <coughs> or COPD, that's going to increase your risk. Or if you've got kidney disease or liver disease or being overweight. These are all the factors uh, that are associated with worse outcomes if you're hospitalised with COVID-19. And then again, UK has come up with lots of research and studies that have highlighted that uh, people from uh, black and Asian minority ethnic population uh, have higher risk, more uh, disproportionately affected. Uh, and that might be largely to do with um, social factors in terms of you know, working in, in where you're more exposed to the risk of coronavirus, maybe if you're, if, you're on, if you're working in hospitals or if you're working on transport or service industries. Uh, and uh, and then maybe also your home life, if your home life is is cross -gener generational, um, that might make it uh, more of a risk for the older people that are living in those families. Uh, however, if you're HIV positive and have very low CD4 count, uh, if you're on chemotherapy, if you're a transplant recipient uh, receiving a, a medication to suppress your immune system, uh, then you're in the group that needs to be super careful. You should be at home and completely shielding, really, and you should be having other people bringing your groceries and making sure you're okay. A question, actually, as I'm thinking of it now, I'm not sure what level of support the government are, are providing now and whether that's matched in terms of the support that was available back in April. No. So that's a sort of... All I was going to say about COVID-19, we can ask, ask all sorts of questions. Like there's some, some, uh, something in the news yesterday about vaccine trials where they're looking at people, uh, looking for volunteers to actually give people the active vaccine, to, the, 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 the virus after the vaccine to see whether that works. Um, there's um, a lot of talk about herd immunity, which is a term to sort of, uh, we shouldn't really be talking about it. We're so far off herd immunity uh, that it's best just to park that to one side, maybe until we get a vaccine. But the theory is that if, say, 80 or 90 percent of the population had already been exposed to coronavirus and generated uh, an immune response, then there wouldn't be enough virus around for people to become infected. Uh, 
um, but that's we're nowhere near that now uh, and it's a very as a way of managing coronavirus it's a very risky thing to do it involves letting people be at risk who who will have very bad outcomes so uh, we, we can come back and talk about that if there's any interest in that uh, the um, few things I was going to say about um, HIV uh, would be um, so first of all just it's, it's always good to emphasize how good the current treatments are you know, we've got uh, we've got 10 combinations that involve just taking one single pill a day uh, the, the drug development for HIV is unlike any other health area really uh, we've, we've benefited from from uh, really good drugs being developed uh, and and yet even some of those new some of these newer drugs we only find out after they've been approved that there's complications that weren't seen in the studies uh, and so there's been two or three conferences large conferences since the last talk positive east uh, one of them was an age big age conference in in the summer and then there was another conference in glasgow uh, about a week ago and one of the subjects of both those meetings was that uh, now people are noticing that the most modern integrase inhibitors dolutegravir and bictegravir have been associated with weight gain considerable weight gain in some people uh, and that that really has been reported more in women than in men uh, and there might be a uh, an, uh, a link to if you're african-american you might have a higher risk of putting on weight. Uh, the new version of tenofovir called TAF, it's not that TAF causes weight gain, it's that tenofovir generally uh, reduces your weight a bit and so people that switch from, ta to, from tenofovir to TAF they're also included in people that have been having some weight gain uh, if they're using these integrase inhibitors. Uh, there's some exciting news, the, the injectable treatment that we've all been interested in and some people are very interested in this. If you don't like pills, uh, you might want to take an injection every one or two months. Uh, and so those injections, just a couple of days ago, uh, the decision at the European Medicines Agency has made, been made to approve these drugs. Uh, and the final approval will come through in a few months. Uh, and so they, we're, we're getting there. Uh, it'll probably take the UK uh, depending on where you are in the UK, another 12 months to decide whether they'll be available or who will be able to use them. But it's it's important to notice that these are, you know, they're, we're on the brink of having the option of injectable treatment. Uh, historically, Scotland tends to make a decision earlier than England. Uh, and then the big general picture, I guess, is that all the there's three main companies that are, are still doing research into better drugs. And all three companies have shifted their uh, their research into really long act, longer acting drugs. So that rather than taking a pill every day, you might take a pill every week. You might have a treatment every month. And then there's a different set of drugs that rather than being oral pills, they tend to be uh, either injections or infusions. Uh, there's very early data that you might be able to just have an infusion every six months. These, these are very early studies. We need to know, you know, they've barely been tried in anyone yet, but if everything goes well, then in a few years time, maybe four or five years time, uh, then your options to alternative pills might include an infusion every six months. And sometimes it's quite good to know uh, what your, what's for the future. You know, if you're having real difficulty with pills, if you don't like pills, if, you've, uh, if you have complications and side effects for current drugs, it's good to know that there's more treatments being developed and coming down the pipeline. Uh, and then a lot of these drugs as well, over the last five or ten years, treatment and uh, prevention have become very close, uh, so that the same drugs that are used to treat HIV are also known to prevent HIV if HIV negative people take them. So there's more slides but I get wary of slides. So these three drugs are interesting. Cabotegravir is the, is the injection, injectable treatment as well. Uh, when it's used for treatment cabotegravir is used with another drug called rilpivirine and both of them are long-acting injections uh, and they involve injections into your muscle every uh, month or every two months. 
A Slatrovir is also being de developed as a uh, uh, as an HIV treatment, and you have these different formulations. Uh, but for this is a, this is a slide about PrEP for people who wanted to prevent infection, you might have the option of a small implant that lasted for a year, and then you might have the chance for a single monthly pill to be used as PrEP or a single monthly pill to be used as PEP. If you're having sex with someone, the condom breaks. This gets close to uh, like a morning after pill, I guess. This family here called BNABs, they're, um, they're sort of like an immune-based treatment and they're also long-acting. So you have them as an infusion and they're being used for treatment and prevention. And then there's a whole range of different uh, approaches to, to PrEP, to prevention, which includes vaginal rings or uh, films, a bit like that mint film you put on your tongue. Uh, there's even uh, research into whether you could have a douche that prevented HIV. So lots of exciting things that I wouldn't talk too much about here. This is the injection. Uh, the slides are available, so so Greg can get these to you afterwards. Uh, so I won't go through everything, but it's it's uh, it lasts a long time. And here, a single injection might be detectable several years after the uh, you've been given it. So that brings another set of issues really about how you manage this drug safely. Uh, this shows how long a single injection. In some people it's there's a good good concentration there after a year. This is the um, the the HIV treatment that's being used, maybe it's being developed as a as a weekly formulation as a pill uh, and it'll be used with other uh, drugs that, that could be used weekly and this is the one that also could be used as a as an implant and so the the illustration here shows you have this like similar to a tiny cotton wool strip that people that wanted to use this drug for prevention could have it uh, under their arm or the back of their neck or something and and you wouldn't know it had it there but it would give you prevent it would give you prep protection if the studies work out for over a year. Uh, the compound itself, just out of interest, comes from a derivative of uh, soy sauce flavoring. And this y Yasama Corporation has been making soy sauce for about 400 years. This, is, this shows you the implant again here. It's really just a, a snapshot to show you that the HIV research hasn't stopped just because we have good treatment uh, and that there's some very exciting things that we couldn't even have thought about five or 10 years ago. And so this was uh, information from a monkey study. All these monkeys, all these animals here were uh, given the, the Islatrovir as pre to pre prevent infection, these were the monkeys that didn't get the, the protection and they all became infected. And this is a good indication that this might work very well. Uh, the drugs I mentioned called BNABs, broadly neutralizing antibodies, actually it's just, it ties us back to cor coronavirus. So, so some of the treatment that's being looked at for uh, COVID-19 is to look at whether antibody treatment would work, immune-based treatment would work uh, to con control uh, COVID-19 and then the same sort of drugs are being looked at for HIV treatment. And I'm just going to leave this as a, as, without much detail but the, the hope, there was a, is a UK study that was about to enrol called RIO, was about to enrol just as coronavirus ha happened earlier this year and that's using uh, two of these monoclonal antibodies together in people who were diagnosed early in infection and went on treatment and the hope is that if you, at least if if you have both these infusions together and then you ask people to stop their treatments they might be able to survive uh, not survive they might be able to to go for six uh, months without needing to take hiv drugs so you'd have these two infusions of immune-based therapy stop your HIV drugs and be monitored and the people who get the active drugs the hope is that that maybe this would replace six months worth of oral therapy.
So this is sort of cutting edge, you know, the frontiers of where the research is going. But I think it's interesting to know about that. One of these antibodies is in prevention study. The results will be out at the end of this year to see whether the infusions prevent people from becoming positive. Um, even though this, the details here, it's not expected to have 100% effect, uh, and there's, there's other issues with the way the study's been designed, uh, it will give us a sort of proof of concept whether this is something worth following up. This is an example of vaginal rings, uh, and it's 3D printing. Uh, so rather than everybody having the same size ring and shape, uh, the technology is there that this could just, as, as well as having an HIV drug that prevented infection, you could also load it with a contraceptive, you could load it maybe with an antibiotic. Uh, and these could be uh, individually printed to or produced, depending on the size of your body and the shape you want and colour and things like that. Uh, this vaginal ring, uh, it was recently approved by the European Medicines Agency uh, not to be used in Europe, unfortunately, um, but it gives you an idea that there's good data supporting that it that, that, that it's works and it's safe, and that in some countries uh, this might make a big difference. Um, I put in a slide at the end, uh, this is from another talk really, uh, but about Tim Brown, Timothy Ray Brown, who was the Berlin patient, and it was just, night, unfortunately he died just at the end of September, um, but I'm sure you would have heard about him and he made a huge impact really. He was an ordinary person who had a really difficult time with, uh, with uh, cancer treatment as an HIV positive person and then as an outcome of successful cancer treatment he was uh, in the very unique situation to find out he was cured of HIV and he spent a lot of time be as an advocate working for PrEP and for U equals U and looking for an HIV cure for everybody else. Uh, so he, one of his things he used to say is, I don't want to be known as the, the person cured for HIV. I want to just be you know, one of many people. And so um, I put a slide in just to remember Timothy Brown. So uh, I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask you that have come in um, from some of our service oh. users. Um, is the efficacy of COVID vaccine affected by HIV medication? That was from Ciro. I would say absolutely not. Definitely not medication. The question, the question is, uh, well, are HIV positive people likely to get as good a response to the vaccine? Uh, and again, most people would say no reason why we shouldn't and that we should be involved in the studies uh, we shouldn't, HIV is not an exclusion criteria for most of these studies. Um, in the US, it was an exclusion criteria and lots of the community activists um, made sure that that was changed very early on. So we should be able to take part in the studies. It's probably quite, probably quite a good thing to, have a, to take part in if you're interested. Uh, and, uh, and then the HIV treatment definitely won't interact with the response. So we're told... Um by the government that if we, should, if we develop symptoms we should self-isolate and stay away from doctors and just and ride it through. If someone um, becomes ill and they've got HIV, what should they do? Sorry, if somebody comes, comes ill with symptoms of COVID. So, so you should follow the, the regular advice in terms of you know, the, how your symptoms are. You should, definitely, you should definitely let your doctor know. And I would make sure that you let your HIV doctor know because they will be uh, experienced in, in knowing how you are as a person, knowing how you relate, to, relate and react to symptoms. Uh, and also uh, they will have more specialist advice from the HIV side of things. So, so absolutely. And, and if for any reason you end up um, going to hospital, going to your local hospital because of COVID-19. You don't always plan these things. You might feel very, very unwell, unwell uh, and just need to go there before you can speak to your HIV doctor. Then make sure that the hospital you go to knows about your HIV status. This is, this is really important. Okay, and lastly, to finish off, um, what experimental treatment do you think Donald Trump had? So I know which experimental treatment because he told everyone. You know, and, he, and at different points, he took drugs that very that few people already knew wouldn't work. And uh, 
uh, and then in the recent the recent uh, 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 outcome where he was diagnosed and and they said that he had COVID nineteen, you know, after having a you know a lovely garden party with two hundred of his mates, none of them were wearing masks, you know, and thirty of them have since gone down with coronavirus. Uh, then he was whisked off to somewhere where he had um, treatment that nobody else really has access to. So I mentioned monoclonal antibodies uh, in, in both sets of slides. So there's an experimental combination of monoclonal antibodies that's only available in research. Uh, and that may or may not have made a difference. But that's sort of the most promising treatment at the moment. And certainly that's something you can only get within a study setting. He, he, the other drug he had was remdesivir, which I mentioned right at the beginning. Uh, and remdesivir is very limited. You really have to be hospitalized to have remdesivir because it's given as an infusion. He would have been given that you know, very early on, earlier than it's needed, even though it wasn't recommended, even though it's not approved early on. Uh, I'm sure I think he, he had remdesivir plus these monoclonal antibodies. Great. Not and, and, and 14 doctors. <laughs> yeah, that does help. <laughs> <laughs> money talks so um it was a really fascinating presentation it's so good to see you again and thanks so much for some really insightful information so the general rule is follow follow regulations just to sum up what do we need to do to stay safe so so follow all the all the government advice that that we had back in march and april be careful uh when you come you go in and out use these little squeezy hand washes when you go into into tesco's and sainsbury's they're good for you use them going in you use them when you're going out it means that don't scratch your face or pick your nose or uh chew your fingers because that's the way it gets into your body uh sensible precautions for everything else so social distance um be really you know take the advice really about not not uh, mixing households unfortunately again that's going to be that's going to be with us for a while until it shuts down uh, and um, uh, and just be just be careful look after yourself look after your friends wear a mask when you're out uh, when you're in confined spaces definitely and then don't worry too much about when you're outside when you're outside I don't think very much infection happens uh, and you can ease off you don't have to be you don't have to be scrubbing your apples and your tins of beans when you get back. You're not going to catch coronavirus that way. Thank you so much, buddy. And I'll see you on the third wave. <laughs> okay. All the best. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thanks, Greg.